Uh, so this session is um, half and half talking about grant proposals and then with whatever time we have left, um, uh, we'll, we were going to practice presentations. There's actually a nice number of us for us to do that. We might be able to make one big group or two smaller groups. Um, but I wanted us to run through practicing our presentations amongst one another and maybe building our confidence or skills in giving presentations. Um, but first, Nigel is going to give us a talk on how to write a good grant proposal. Thank you very much, James. Thanks. Right. So, first question. How many people here have written a grant proposal? And what was yours? Uh, I'm on the regular list for question. Okay. What type of proposal? To who? Uh, German Research Foundation, but okay. only partly written, so together with my supervisors. Okay, and? Uh, it was a short proposal to get a grant to go abroad uh, from my university. It was, about, so it was a, a small site Good. project. Okay, and who here is anticipating or thinking about maybe staying in academia, applying for positions in academia? Nearly everybody, right? Which means you are going to have to write grant proposals, okay? Many of them, okay? So what I'm going to do in the next 20 minutes, and then there's time for questions and everything else, is talk to you a little bit about the guidelines of writing uh, grant proposals. I don't know, I've said more than 100, I probably maybe more than 200, I don't know, and 500 peer reviews, maybe more than that. So, yes you get to do a lot of them in your career. Oops, wrong way. Going forward, I did that one. Yes, yeah. okay. So, the first thing about grant proposals is it doesn't, it, it doesn't really scale with size. The rules that for writing a good grant proposal can be the same for a thousand euros or writing one of the super big EU project proposals at 10 million. At your stage, if you haven't written them or you're in early stage, the, the, the start small, okay? But above all, start. So there are opportunities for you to write small grant proposals. For example, you could have written and applied for time on TAs in the Euro Planet. You could have written, or maybe you have and not thought about it. You have may apply for bursaries to go to conferences. These are the first starting points about starting to write things, okay? Because proposal writing is a skill, okay? It requires practice. You get better at it as you go on, okay? Many people are scared of writing grant proposals. I have a, a extremely, I have an extremely good PhD in postdoc student. She decided that she didn't actually want to become a traditional academic. She wanted to go more in the technical support side of one of the facilities. And that was because she didn't like writing grant proposals and she didn't like giving presentations. Uh, if, you are going to, if you are going to work in academia, and it will be the same in industry, because if you go to work in industry, you will write lots of grant proposals. They may be internal proposals, but you will probably still have to write them because you're going to be asking for money for the company or you're going to be asking to employ somebody to, in, in your team. So don't, you, and so most of the time you will fail. Okay, golden rule number one. You know, I've never met anybody who says, yes, I've had 100% success in grant proposals. I don't believe them, right? Um, so most of the time in academia, you will write proposals that won't be successful. And this is one of the golden rules of becoming an academic, right? There are many advantages of being an academic. You have a lot of, it, still, you have a lot of freedom and you choose your research that you want to do. Your research becomes personal. But that kind of means that when you are successful, often it might be a team success, but particularly if you're setting up a group, it will be a personal success, which is great. But it also means when you fail, it seems like a personal failure, right? It, it, you can't work in this area if you, if you are afraid of failure because you will fail. And you have to have a strategy for coping with a disappointment, okay? You're not allowed to go home, kick the cat, back up the flat, etc. You might feel like it, but you can't, okay? The, same, the next key point is nobody, anybody writing a grant proposal, nobody is expert. You always want to have somebody else who helps you write the proposal. So one of the things you may have talked about this week, if you're going to do any type of career, 
but particularly in the academic sector, but also in the industrial sector, find mentors. Now, a mentor is a very important person and you need them at all stages in life. I still have mentors. When I became head of department, I had a different type of mentor than when I had one when I was an academic, younger academic. You need mentors. But mentors are not friends. It is not the job of a mentor to read your proposal and say, that's good. Because they're doing no benefit to you whatsoever. You want somebody like me who will rip it to shreds. Okay? <laughs> In a friendly way and a constructive way, but has to tell you that ain't that's not, you haven't got the message over, etc. And when I send things out, and when we write things like the Euro Planet proposal, we write it as a team, and then we have people who, who read it critically. Now, we have people within the team who read it critically, but we also have people outside who we have friends, if you like, to say, are we getting the message over? So if you're going to write a grant proposal, particularly if you're applying for a fellowship, or you're doing, you're even maybe applying for a job, for a lectureship, get somebody who can be your mentor and develop that. And we do have mentors in the Euro Planet Society. The other key thing about grant proposals is you actually have to follow the rules. Many people think that they can use one grant proposal and then give it to four or five, write, use the same one at four or five different uh, agencies. No, because the rules of the agencies are different. You have to bear in mind what the objectives of the agency are, and they will be different from each one. Okay. It's the same as when you write your CV. Personalize it. Right? I was giving one of these talks about how to write CVs at one of the training schools, and it was a classic example. The night before, I had received from somebody uh, a CV saying, you know, dear esteemed professor, you know, I really want to come and work in your group. I'm really excited about the work that you're doing, and, um, you know, please would you consider me for a postgrad? That was great, until five minutes later, I got the same email addressed to another professor who I know with exactly the same, because he'd forgotten to change the email, so he sent me the one to the other professor. So he's obviously sending it out to lots of other people. And if you are applying for a job, you, you have to tailor your experience to the job. A generic CV doesn't work. My wife used to do this, and her boss used to say, right, I've got 200 applications for this job, I want 40 on my desk tomorrow. You get rid of 160 of them. And her job was just crap, 160, okay? So you have to tailor things. You have to bear in mind who you're writing to. And the other golden rule, and we'll come on to this later on, is all grant proposals are reviewed. And you've got to think about the person who is reviewing it, okay? Because if you hack off the person who's reviewing it, you won't get it. Right. On Sunday, I got here on Saturday and Sunday, I was doing some for my colleagues at work and got a very good person. He'd written a very good person, but he was annoying me in his proposal. Because I was on page three, still trying to find out what the damn story was. Right. Now, most reviewers are highly busy academics who are trying to do other things. Right. When do reviewers, as you see in a minute, when do we do the reviewing? Right. We do it anywhere. We do it at conferences. We do it on planes to conferences. We do it on Sunday afternoons when a daughter wants to do something else and your wife wants to take you out to see somebody else. If you have to think about the reviewer, the reviewer needs to get a simple message. If the reviewer has to work to try and understand what your grant proposal is about, they're not going to give you a good mark. So this is the real, real politic. Okay. So why are proposals important and why I should be doing them? Well, in academia or in industry, they empower you to do your own research. It is not, if you go into industry, particularly as most of you will have got PhDs or you've got postdoc experience, you will go in at a managerial level. That means they're expecting you to run a team. If you're working in a company, if they're in the industry session, then that you will have to ask your company for the resources to build your team. They don't just give it to you. You've got to write a proposal and say, right, I've got this the company has given me this contract to, to do something. Um, I am now in charge of finding the team. I've now got to go back to the to the, by my line manager and say, actually, I need another engineer. I need somebody else. So you're always going to have to write these proposals to do your research, whether it's in an industry or whether it's personal and academic research. The reason for writing proposals is it proves that you've got good ideas. You have to communicate those ideas to the other people to enable you to support your work. 
Okay. So there are a few proposals that, that, you, that there's very few places now where you just get given money and said, oh, we've appointed you as an academic, you know, here's 100,000 a year for getting on with it. That used to be the case 60 years ago. Now everything you have to write proposals for. So you've got to write a proposal to show that your ideas, to communicate those ideas to the people who are going to give you the money to support your work. But as I say, the roadblocks, the first one is fear of failure. If I don't try, I can't fail. Um, so you've got to flip that around. You, 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 if you don't try, you're not, if you don't buy the lottery ticket, you can't win the lottery, okay? So first of all, accept the fact that many of the proposals you write won't be successful. Always have to think about a plan B. Never, if you know the English expression, keep all your eggs in one basket. So if you're, if you're going for that fellowship proposal, if it's the only thing you've got to think of, you know, you say, if I don't get that fellowship, what am I going to do? If you don't get it, it's going to hit you twice as hard as everything else. You put all your eggs in that basket. You think, well, you know, oh, you know, my, my partner's here. If I don't get this fellowship, I can't stay in this country. You know, it's all going to be a disaster. You know, you've got to always have a plan B, okay? Because, because you're more likely to fail than you are succeed. So you've got to think about what the alternative plan is. You've got to have several plans at the same time. What's the best predictor of success in writing a grant proposal? So that's what you've got to ask. That. What, how can you maximize the chance of being successful? Mm -hmm. Funding success rates are often less than 20%. So as I say, most of the time you're going to fail. Your job is to put the odds on your favor. In writing a good proposal, you're beating the other guy, right? It's comp competitive, right? Mm -hmm. You've got to do better than the other person. That's, that's the only thing, okay? So you can have a brilliant idea, you still got to show it's better than the other person. That's where the competition comes in. And that's why often proposals, if you go for pure safety, people will say, oh, that's good, that's fine, that's, you know, it's good more stuff, but it's just more of the same. Um, and so most funding that you go for will always be wanting to show why you're at the cutting edge, why you're doing something new. And particularly if you're writing fellowship proposals, why you? We'll come to that in a moment. So as I say, the advice, start small. Even now, submit at least one proposal a year. Apply for travel grants, apply for bursaries. Because when you come to write, say you write a fellowship proposal, or you go for interview, they will ask you, give us an example of something you've done independent of your supervisor or whatever. You know, what did you do? If you said, oh, yeah, I put forward, I had this TA, I, I had this idea to do a project and it was involved me using some facilities somewhere. So I applied for a Year Planet TA and I got it. Or a travel grant. Um, I, I, I thought, you know, oh, my research should be useful, but I, I met this person at the conference and then I realized there was some funding to go and visit them. And so I came up with this idea for a project to go and visit them and now we're, we're working together. Those are the small scale proposals. There may only be one or two pages, but they start to make you think about it. And it looks good on your CV when you're young because we're actually showing us that you had some independence. Okay. Longer term, you, you, this is where you kind of have, if you're an academic, you're going to fail, but you have to have a feeling of what you want to do. You can't, you, you know, you don't change direction every, every year and say, well, this year I'm going to do planetary geology. And, Next year, I'm going to do astrochemistry. And, oh, I decided this year I'll apply for a grant to do uh, build an instrument. You've got to think about who you are and the vision you've got, particularly if you're building a career. So if you don't know where you're going, you'll end up nowhere. So it's really important to start to think about what you're trying to do. And that's why you need your mentors, because the mentors are there to help you on that journey. So traditionally, you do your PhD. You do your, at the end of your PhD, most people will move from that institution. If you have done your undergraduate degree and your PhD at the same institute, you will start to be categorized, right? You know, and it's never good to stay at the place where you did your, all your degree because the professors will still, even when you are an independent person, they will still see you as the 19 year old or 20 year old student and they will probably remind you of it. I had a colleague at UCL who every year, even when I was, I've been promoted to, to basically one below a professor at the exam board every year would start off by reminding everybody that in my final year nuclear physics exam, I crossed out the right answer and wrote the wrong answer. And he would tell it to everybody in the exam board every year, this story. Oh yeah, when Nigel was a student, right? Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so you do need 
to, to, to move. Okay, and, and so you do your first degree, and maybe you do your PhD in the Institute, and then at some stage you do your first postdoc. When you go on to that postdoc stage, you may still be working for somebody, because most of the time you are probably employed on somebody else's grant. But at that stage, you've got to start to be your independent person. If you want to continue in the, in the, in the, in the, in the field, you have got, you're going to have to start to show that you are not the left or right hand of whatever supervisor you're working for. Okay. So you've got to make that break. And that means you've got to start writing your own little proposals and so on. And hopefully, and I think most of the time, because we have kind of moved away from the hair professor system, uh, I do remember work when I was a postgrad going to a German group and literally uh, the German professor, he was like, you know, kind of like we could see him basically leading a panzer brigade. And literally the students would have to click their heels and salute when he came in in the morning. Now, I hope that you're probably not in that environment anymore. Um, so professors and so on today do understand where you're trying to be. And if you are a postdoc, you should be talking to them about the next step, and the next step means you've got to, 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 to do your independence. So they would expect you and hopefully support you in writing proposals. Okay. Once you've decided what type of proposal to write, it might be a Marie Curie proposal, it might be a national food proposal, get copies of people who have been successful, right? Because the best examples are people who have been successful, okay? So, and they exist. And indeed, most institutions have copies of these, and indeed, they're expected to pass them around. So as ac young ac academics, when they become their lecturers or et cetera, you put them through a training course and you do exactly this, and you show them examples and so on of successful proposals. Even now, it, if we, we've written some training networks recently, we weren't successful. We've had years of being successful. The last two weren't successful. And we're thinking, why? So we've, we've tried to contact people who in the last two rounds who have been successful and try and see what they've put in the proposal that we hadn't. So always get examples. The next thing is, if you are writing a proposal, don't leave it too late. Because everybody leaves it too late. Right? And particularly if it's your first proposals, it takes more time than, than somebody like me. But even, you know, academics are, are notoriously bad at, at leaving things to the last minute deadlines. Uh, my wife used to say working with academics was like herding cats. Uh, and she's right. So we, you know, we, we have deadlines, so we cheat. We have all these members of Europlanet and we never tell them the right deadline. We never tell them the deadline that, we, that we're working to. Because if we told all the, all the people in this meeting when the deadline actually was for sending the review in, they would send it in on the day when we actually have to submit it. So we just don't tell them what the right day is. We know what the day is. We tell them an earlier day because it's the only way that we're ever going to get them in on time. And it's the same for writing. We always say we are not going to submit the proposal at 10 to 5, because all European deadlines are 5 o'clock, on the day. And we always say we're going to have the proposal finished, and it's usually maybe it's on a Tuesday, so we're going to have it finished on the Friday. We know that we won't have all the stuff on the Friday. We know that. But we've told everybody, Friday's the last day. If it's not in by Friday, you won't be in the proposal. So we build it in. Same for you. Make sure you've got a, a gap between the, the final deadline and, and when you think you have the finished proposal, because they, it will always overrun, and if you want people to read it and so on. So don't leave it too late. You have to plan it. And if you're writing a, a fellowship proposal, like a Marie Curie proposal, you should be starting three months before the deadline, minimum to start writing that proposal and getting all the stuff together for a fellowship, ERC, perhaps even six months before. Mm -hmm. It's a long period of time to do it. Now, it will be reviewed. So usually, as you should assume that the reviewer is a generalist in your field who knows a little bit about your particular topic, but is not an expert, okay? Now, if you do get an expert, that's fine. But for much of the proposal, when you go to a panel, right, normally what happens in a panel is there'll be a spokesperson, okay? So one of the panel will have to speak on your proposal. Now, generally, that might be somebody who's a bit, bit more expert. So they'll look down on the panel and they'll say, right, we've got, a, we've got this, this space science panel, or this physics panel. Okay, so if you're on a physics panel and they say, yeah, you're, you're the astronomer, you're, you, do, you do everything, right? So I say, great. I've just got one on, on gauge theory and cosmology. Yeah, brilliant. And absolutely nothing about that. 
But I am I probably know more about it than the person over there who is doing uh, cell cell manipulation. But you aren't just in a panel. You've not only got to get the vote of the person who's speaking on your proposal. You've got to get the vote of all the other people on the room. And that means that they will look at your proposal, and if they don't understand your proposal and get an idea of why it's exciting right at the beginning, they won't vote for it. So always think about, when you write about it, is to convince the person who's doing the refereeing that this idea is worthwhile. Why is it now? Why is your project, how does it fit into the bigger picture? So you, you write the challenge. You say how you're going to address that challenge. And you also have to say, why you? We'll come to that in a moment. So the formatting is very important, right? So remember, again, right, it's Sunday. Sunday's a good day for doing referees. It's normally when I do most of my refereeing on a Sunday afternoon, uh, in between most recently trying to get my daughter to revise for her exams. So I'm sitting down to read these, these six or eight proposals on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, I do not want to open up a piece of text that is incredibly crowded with, a, with dense text and full of acronyms that I don't know what they mean and tiny text that I need to get a magnifying glass out to read or I have to go onto my computer and sort of put it up to plus 200 you know, so I can read it. None of that. Think how you would like to look at it. It looks attractive. Use diagrams. Diagrams are brilliant because I can have that picture in my mind of what you're trying to do. If your diagram tells me the story, if you're doing star formation or something, show me a nice picture and so on. If you're doing something in astrobiology and it's something to do with some weird exobiology thing, show me a picture. Something that I can get, in. and because that's, that, I will have that. We all like pictures, so friendly formatting. Usually there's a template and they give you the order of the sections requested, right? Don't be clever and try and change the sections, right? I'm scoring these proposals, right? And you normally have to write a mark for each section, right? And if I find somebody who's suddenly reversed section three and four, it throws me. And I could put the marks in the wrong box. I do not want to think, right? I've got to just do this job. And I'll find it. So don't start changing things around. Follow the format. And usually there's a good reason for doing it. They, they put them in order for a reason, for what they want. And one follows on from the other. So do that. You can use different fonts to highlight important points. I'll say fonts rather than color because sometimes people still you know, don't always use, if they print them out, they don't always print them out in color, okay? Now, most people today review online, okay? And indeed, some of the forms are only online these days. But in the old days, people would print them out. It doesn't mean that they'll print them out in color, okay? But you can use different fonts. You can use italic and you can use bold and you can underline. But the point is to make a point. If every second line is in bold italic or something else, you've made to your, you, you've lost the impact. It's just those key points that you want to highlight. Mm -hmm. One of the things I always do, which sounds a bit mad, but it does actually work, is I read my proposal aloud. Okay, because you you'll find the bits that you want to emphasize when you do that. You know that bit. Okay, my voice has gone inflected there. That's the point I want to make important. Okay. Usually. At the beginning, you're going to have to state the hypothesis or the goal, okay? And you've then, what you're going to do in your proposal is say, this is what I want to do. This is my idea. This is my hypothesis I want to test or the goal that I want to do. You then have to produce concrete results. What, is the, what are you going to do in, these, in this two, three, four years, okay? So you've got to anticipate the results of your hypothesis. What are you going to do? And then how do you know you've, you've achieved them? How do, how, do you, how do you know that you've set out to do something? How do you know you've been successful? Okay, that's, that's the story of a good story. Make sure you address all the criteria, okay? So every of these things, they'll say, do this, do that. Read all the points, because each of those criteria will probably have a score. And if it isn't there, you get a zero. So make sure you read it carefully to assess all the criteria that you're doing. Right. So, read the rules that most have. So let's talk about the first one, thematic and areas of priority, right? Link to them, but don't lie, okay? Don't say that your, your research is, is, is actually relevant to something when it really isn't and you're trying to push the thing. You know, everybody tries to do that. You know, oh, yeah, yeah, I need to say something about climate change. Um, star formation, climate change, uh, no. 
right? You might think you're being very clever and finding some kind of clever link, but normally it doesn't hold up. So these are the things that you normally have, the quality and the science. That's the first part, and, and, and usually you, that will be the bit you're happy to write. Okay? You, you, you know the science you want to do, but you've got to put it in context. You've got to say why your science is the really important science. Okay? There are hundreds of proposals. Most of those proposals are really good. I mean, you, know, you get very few really awful proposals these days. So most of the science is perfectly worthwhile. You've got to go beyond that. You have got to persuade the reviewer that your science is the most exciting science to do now and that you're the person to do it. Now, there's a gender imbalance in this room, okay? Women do not sell themselves well. Women are normally shyer than men in coming forward. And this goes throughout the entire career. When I took over as my head of school in my recent one, we had no women had been uh, uh, got, uh, in, the, in the higher grades. And I looked at their CVs and I said, why, 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 aren't, why haven't you put in a promotion case? Oh, well, you know, I don't really think I'm quite ready for it yet. Women love to talk, talk themselves down more than... There some, and, there, and that goes for some um, ethnicities. You don't normally have a problem getting an American to speak up and say they're brilliant. Right? <laughs> Americans are very good, they're trained to do it, right? The British are a bit more reserved, right? And it's wording. If you're applying for a fellowship, you don't write we. Because it's personal, you write I. I've done this, I've done that. Now, women don't like doing that in general, and many nation states don't like doing it. So, so Brits don't tend to usually say me, they like to say the team. Indians usually are always about the team. Chinese are usually about the team. But you're applying for an independent fellowship. It's you. You've got to be prepared to say, I did this, I did that. And most people don't like doing that. However, what you will find is that generally uh, women write, uh, can I say, more, uh, more self-critiqued proposals. They tend to be more self-critical. Guys tend to be a bit more, ah, we'll, we'll blag it through, guys, right? You know, women tend to be more self critical. That means that often you will find that your proposals, women's proposals, are, they're almost, they're, they sometimes read as if they're trying to convince themselves as well as trying to convince you. Okay, they're being quite self critical. So you've got to get out of that mindset because you've got to be, you've got to be confident in what you do. And I say, I'm not saying that there aren't, but that men don't have self-criticism. Of course, there are men who equally are, are self-critical and so on. But you do find this. Okay. So get over that because actually, you know, we are getting, we've, we, the world has changed. I know we've got the diversity committee and everything else, but it's very different from 20, 30 years ago. And in space science, you know, I, used to, I show a picture in one of my courses of the Cassini Huygens team, which was about 150 people at ESA when it was first being launched. There is only one woman in that picture, and she was the secretary, right? Now, what do we have now? We have Evine van Dishon. We have uh, um, Giovanna Tonetti running Ariel. We have Heike Rauer running Plato. You know, these missions are now being run by top women scientists. So, so we have made a huge amount of differences now in that. So be confident about what you are. You have to be confident. You have to learn that confidence. I don't know if you have it in Europe, but we have something in the UK. It's called the imposter syndrome, where people don't think that they really should be there, right? Imagine that you're in a, 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 a sports team, right? And, and you are the player in the team who doesn't think you should be on the pitch. You are, you are not going to, that team is going to suffer from that, right? You know, but they wouldn't have put you on the pitch if they didn't think that you could do a job. Nobody's going to put somebody forward or put something forward if they don't think you're going to succeed. So if your institute says, you know, I really think, you know, you should be putting in for a Marie Curie or ERC, they're not doing it to be kind. They're doing it because they actually do think that you're capable of doing it. You've just got to think that you're capable of doing it. Okay? So a bit of positive mindset. You need that to write the science, okay? So, 
So you've written the science, you've understood the project that you want to do, which is passionate for you, but then you've got to put it in the importance to the field. Okay, so you've got to, and this is where you might need the mentor. As you get older and you get more experienced, you might understand where you fit in the field. But maybe at your stage, you won't quite know how your project fits in. You know, my study of exoplanet atmospheres, how does that fit into the wider sphere? So that's why you have your mentor and you have your advisor to do that, because that helps you write that bit. But when you're at conferences and you're seeing things like that, references, really important. You know, you should all be having your big list of references. You should all be on Google Scholar Alerts and all these things to find out the most relevant uh, papers that come out in your field. And not just your little bit of narrow field, because actually what you really want to do is to show how your work fits into a wider picture. So if you say, oh, I only look at Jovian atmospheres and nothing else, but I'm building a model of a Jovian atmosphere. Well, that's rather limiting because actually your model might be good for, for Uranus atmosphere or something else. So you might want to look at papers on that. Then there is the impact, which is wider than the field. Nearly all proposals now in nearly every country expect you to say, how is your research useful for people, not just scientists? Okay. Mm. And this is the difficult bit, right? And believe me, top people writing for your planet and so on, these proposals, they struggle with that. We, you know. But if you write a proposal, uh, you get one third of the marks for the science, one third of the marks for the impact, and one third of the marks for saying how good you are with doing the resources and the management. So impact is an art and you and you will have to learn that and you will have to go on courses and you'll have to look at what people do, etc. But it is things like outreach, dissemination, how you're going to communicate your research to others. Um, if you are applying for a fellowship, which might give you people to work, you know, you might be applying for an ERC and therefore employing postgrads or something. Uh, you would be expected to say how you're how you're going to engage with other stakeholders. So 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 you know where are you going to present this work at conferences? How may are you going to talk to industry? Are you going to link with people outside your country or outside Europe in the impact section? So so read that and I say there are plenty of examples and you can ask people in Europe Planet for help on that uh, because anybody who's written European proposals that have been successful had to have done that and it's something it takes years to learn how to do so. You know, you don't expect to get it right first time, and that's why you do. Then the applicant. Why you or why your team? And as I said, this is where you need to sell yourself. Okay, if it's a fellowship, it's I. It's not we, it's I. Right? And I know you'll hate doing it because you'll think, oh my God, that looks really bad. I'm saying I'm an expert in this and I'm not. Right. <laughs> but you have to, if you don't have confidence in yourself and the proposal, say, because fellowships are not about, they don't give a fellowship to a team. They give a fellowship to you. And when you go for an interview, it's why you. So you've got to get into this as I said, get out of this imposter syndrome and everything else. You are already at this stage, having gone on to do PhDs and postdocs, you're already part of an elite, right? You know, you, you're already, you know, you've been just doing a PhD means that you were actually pretty good in your bachelor's year. So you've already done many stages. And many of you are probably working at top institutes. They don't employ PhD students, or hopefully they don't employ PhD students who are complete duffers. They employ you because they think you're actually quite good, right? So you should already be able to be in that position. You've got to prove, however, why you are good for this project. So you've got to explain your skill set. Okay. And as you go up, you've got to explain more of your skill set. Okay. And you've got to evidence base it. Okay. So if you say, you know, I'm an expert in GCMS or I'm an expert in this in this particular code, you've got to reference it. How did you, how, how can you show that you are an expert in that code? Well, you've got to show a publication or something that you did that has your name on it to show that you use the code. Okay. So publications are really important. Okay. Now, this may not affect you now, but I will tell you one of the biggest problems for early career people is to break away from the mentor, supervisor, et cetera, right? If you are in a big group, there is the professor. Now, some of the groups used to have a tradition that professor's name has to go on everything, regardless of whether they did anything at all to do with the project. That's gone. But many people still feel, oh, well, you know, I think I should probably put my supervisor's name on that one, even if it's super, they're no longer their supervisor. You know, I'm working in the same group, and or I'm working in another group, but you know, oh yeah, you know, maybe I should add uh, Evine or Nigel or Pierre to, to their publication. 
when you look at that as an independent referee and you're trying to say, is this person independent? And you see every single publication down there is still with their PhD supervisor. How can that person have become independent? So at some stage, you're going to have to have that difficult conversation where you're going to have to say to your supervisor, I've written this paper, but I'm not putting your name on it. If they actually took a full role, of course. But don't do it for being polite. Don't do it because you think, oh, if I put their name on it, it's going to have a better chance of being published than poor little me, because the referees will think that, you know, oh, if I put Professor so-and-so, it's bound to get published. But if I don't put so-and-so on, oh, the referees won't like it. The referees referee a paper because it's good or bad. I, I trash loads of ones with senior people's referees' names on them. Uh, and I get quite a few criticisms of mine. At some stage, if you develop your academic career, you have to cut your, 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 your ties. You have to show you're independent. And the way you do that is by having publications which you're leading with your PhD students or your master's students or your team. Okay. The other thing that people find very difficult initially is to work out how much resources and how much and how they're going to manage the project because you probably haven't had to do this yet. So do, do you know how much it costs to fund a PhD student? Do you know how much resources, you know, how many, how many leases of liquid nitrogen do I need to cool down the cryostat for the next five years? You, you haven't had to do that because the other people in the group have done it, but now it's your turn to do it, okay? Now, if you are applying for some of these fellowships, you might be having half a million, a million, million and a half euros of taxpayers' money, right? Now, I suspect that nobody in this room has done a financial management course, <laughs> right? It won't surprise you that most academics haven't done a financial management course, which is probably why most universities are in the mess they're in, because these people get promoted to be the managers and they haven't got any more clear than that. So they just go from not being able to manage a million to not being able to manage 200 million. Okay? That's why you have people, why in your planet, we have people like Sophia and Susmita. You, you think, people think, oh, you're the coordinator, you're in charge. I'm not in charge. You know. Susmita tells me the project management, Sophia tells me the budget, and Anita tells me what to do anyway, right? Has done for 15 years. So, but you're going to have to manage this. So you're going to have to start thinking about it. Because then you get your project, and if you haven't got the resources right, and you find after a year of your two-year project, you haven't got enough money to run your experiments, or you, you can't go on any conferences because you spent all the money, nobody's going to give you some more. So when you start writing these things, you need to think about it. That's why writing small proposals. You see, if you, if you just come to a conference and your group pays for your travel and your hotel, you don't really, do you really know how much it costs to come to a conference? No. But if you had to write a bid for a bursary, you would have to write down how much it is. Okay? So that's the, that's the simple stuff. Do you know how much it is? If you want to have a PhD student, do you know how much it costs? It's not just the money you got as a PhD student because they're all the overheads and everything else that the university pays. You need to know that because you're now applying for the bid and you'll be in charge of this. Okay. And then how about managing a project? Okay. Now, you're going to manage your own project, which means you're going to have to do time management. Okay? Now, another thing, academics are really bad at time management, right? You know, it literally is, and you see this. I sometimes wonder how anything ever gets into space. If you deal with a big team, you think, you know, and, and there are national characteristics as well, and there's, there's, there's different ways of working in different countries. But you're going to have to manage this project, okay? So you're going to have to manage your time to make sure you get the deliverables. So if you set ridiculous, if you set yourself targets that you can't meet, it's your, it's your fault, okay? You've got to be realistic. Then you get to the stage of managing a team, okay? Now, Let's say you've got your ERC proposal. Brilliant, right? You're going to have uh, one postdoc, and you're going to have three PhD students, and you've now got the one and a half million to manage, right? How are you good at managing people? Right? So you're going to start... start now, you may all complain about your supervisors. Why are you going to be any better than them? Are you going to make the same mistakes, right? Because nobody sets out to be a bad manager. But what experience have you got in that? So you go for your interview and they say, look, actually, brilliant proposal, really good. You, but, you know, you've got really quite an ambitious idea here and you're going to have a team of five or six. What experience have you got in managing anybody? Well, what can you do? If you're in a big group, you can manage maybe master's students or final year PhD student projects. 
take them on, right? I assure you that most professors usually would think if you volunteer to take one of, uh, one of my final year students and do it rather than me, I might have to do the marking at the end, but believe me, I'll be very grateful for, for you taking on the, the students. It's good for you, you get some experience. And then you'll be able to say in the interview, well, you know, yeah, I, 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 I've, uh, I managed, you know, uh, each year of my PhD, I managed a final year project student and, you know, it's, uh, and they got a paper out of it and so on. You've already talked about the management. What style do you have as a manager? Every, there, there are courses you can work out what type of person you are, right? These, 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 uh, it's very worthwhile doing. You, we should go on to one of these uh, self-assessment courses to find out what type of person or what type of manager you are. They're well worth doing. Okay, so we'll quickly go through the other ones. So the quality, the criterion is basically, again, I've said it, novelty, relation to context. Why now? Why not five years time? How ambitious it is? How is it going to transform the field? But within context, people tend to write that they're going to transform the entire world in these proposals. You're not. It's got to be, you're going to make a change, but you're not going to reshape the entire field, et cetera. And then why is the methodology that you're doing appropriate? And then, as I say, the international importance. If it's a national proposal, you've got to write to what's required nationally. If it's an EU proposal, what's required EU? How does it meet uh, the activities of each of those? So if you're writing national proposals, read what the nation states wants. If it's an EU proposal, it's wider, it's got to use the EU word, and you've got to embed yourself in Europe. The impact, as I said, effectiveness um, of the activities concerned and the appropriateness of any partners and so on you have. You've done the applicants again. It's, it's you. It's all about you. And the resources and management, as I said, it's a difficult thing to do if you haven't done it before. Do it. So, uh, some other final points. As you get on, you will find that larger proposals are more likely to be successful than individual proposals because there are fewer of them and there's a bigger chance of success if they're written properly. So at some stage, you will want to be involved in a large proposal. You do not volunteer to run a 10 million proposal from the standing start. You start somewhere else in the proposal and speed up. So you're going to be working with co-eyes uh, and partners. You've got to choose those. A, some courses, say, are particularly geared towards those. So you might be a small part of that. Um, as an early career, as I say, your proposals are more likely to be smaller and personal. Early career researchers, reviewers do know that you are young and inexperienced. We're not sadists. You know, we, don't, we don't sit there with the idea of massacring you. So we know that, that there, and often for fellowships, it's not only that what you do, we're looking for the potential. We're looking to, 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 to see that you could be a longer term career person. For fellowships, normally somebody once said it, I'm looking to see if this is a person I want to work with for the next 10 years. I want a colleague. I'm looking at somebody who's going to transfer from being a, 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 a postdoc to being my colleague. Okay, so I'm looking for that potential of somebody who I want to work with for the next 10 or 15 years. Uh, again, their skills, give examples. We talked about leadership and uh, being on committees. You can join APEC committees, that's good for a CV, arranging research visit. If you know the COST program, the COST has these short term scientific missions lasting up to a month. If there's one in your area, there's one recently just been announced in, uh, in, in star formation and planetary uh, disks, for example. You will get, you can apply to go to another lab for two to four weeks. We've had the year of planet 10 uh, Have a vision, but normally early careers are too optimistic. It's not a bad thing to be optimistic, but if you're really going to tell me that you're going to solve all the problems of cosmology in the next three years with one PhD student, you're not. And normally, as I'm doing on Sunday, it was trying to say, you know, you've got seven objectives in four years, all of which are massive, and you've got one PhD student and two postdocs. It's not going to work, and that's why you need the mentors. Common failings, too much jargon. You, 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 you're on top of it, and you know all the acronyms and everything else. I don't, okay? So they become very jargon, very detailed, but they don't give you the big picture. Make sure you acknowledge other people's work. Make sure you do a proper literature review. If as a referee, I see my papers being cited, I like it. If I know I've written a key paper in that field and you don't cite it, I don't like it. 
So make sure you do the literature review. Give yourself enough time to write the proposal. We can read, we can tell when a proposal's been rushed. Usually, people are far too ambitious in the time scale and they don't have the resources. You cannot do it all. You don't want to be too conservative and too, but you don't want to say that you can change the world. We once had an American student came for an interview in a fellowship panel, and she started off by telling us that basically she was that the paradigm that she was addressing was the, the community was wrong and she was right. The panel did not say a word to each other, but we were all annoyed. We gave her the worst questioning because she just annoyed us. She's telling us that we don't know what we're doing, and she does. No. So don't be too ambitious, but do it. Okay. In conclusion, it's it's your life. It doesn't matter whether you're in academia or industry, you do it, you will fail. What do you do when you fail? Right? You need a support network when you fail because you will, and you need to sort of pick yourself up and have another go. So get your support network. And finally, you can do as many guidelines as you like. Sometimes you, a bit of luck helps, and sometimes your proposal will be in the right place at the right time, and sometimes it will be in the good proposal at the wrong time because there might be some really other experts who have really put some really good proposals in that round, and you just slip below the cutoff because there are just so few more better than yours that time. And last year it would have been funded and this year it won't be. So you've got to go again. And that's why you need your plan B. Never try to have a situation where your entire life relies on that one project. Right? You know, my life is at an end because I didn't get this proposal. It's not a good mental health problem. Awesome. Question. Probably much longer than I thought. I didn't want to speed you up because this was all released. So and questions. Can I just kick off the questions with one quick one? Yeah. You mentioned right at the beginning it's important to have a strategy to deal with failure so you don't kick your cat or destroy your kitchen. What's your strategy? When my early days, I would say one thing was to have a very patient partner. Uh -huh. Because I do remember, she, she reminds me that one time when I said, oh, this is it, let's stop not getting anywhere, I'm just going to quit going to teaching. And she said, stop it. She needs somebody to say, stop feeling sorry for yourself. Get in there and do it again. You need somebody just to say, oh, stop, stop whining. Okay. Right, you know. Um, you need to talk, talk to others who have been through the same thing because uh, everybody's been there and it's always you think it's just you. But you, you need to have other people say, yeah, I was there. And, and, and this is where you have the mentor, somebody who's been through that process, who's identified that process. Somebody who, who, who's like you, who might have come from a background and felt, I didn't really feel I fit in, fit, fit in, and you know, it took me a while and I got the imposter syndrome. We have a whole network of, 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 of women in the UK who I've mentored, and then I said, right, you've been successful, now you want you to mentor the next generation of women, because they all have the same problems. And they could say, well, yeah, I had exactly the same thing. You know, I felt, you know, I just felt, in, 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 I felt inadequate. And, you know, and I, how did I get over that? How did I get over the imposter syndrome? Or, you know, somebody else said, you know, I, I just, you know, I, I, I was trying to fit in when I was going to have a family. And, you know, you know, what, how do you do that? Or what did you do with the two body problem? You know, you, you need those things. But most of all, you just really need somebody to, to vent on. Uh -huh. There's a great story of Harry Kroto, who won the Nobel Prize. <clears throat> Who, who came in, in those days it was envelopes, he picked up the envelope, opened in the envelope, and it's from the research council, it said, Dear Professor Kroto, we regret to inform you that despite your proposal being very highly ranked, and you know, unfortunately in this round there was insufficient funds and you know, to fund your proposal. So what does Harry do? He does what we used to do in those days, he goes down to have a tea in the tea room, and he comes in, he says, bloody hell, he said, you know, this is ridiculous, I've just invented this new material, and I haven't got the damn grant, he's having a complete vax, you know, and his secretary comes down and says, there's a phone call from Sweden. Oh? Yeah, it was to say, you've won the Nobel Prize. No. Now, question, do you think he got the next grant from the research council? Because he had the, if they knew he knew he had the Nobel yeah. Prize, I yeah. guess. So, yeah. Yes, he got the next one, right? Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine being the panel member who was on the panel who yeah. didn't turn down the guy who then just gets the Nobel Prize? On the other hand, I have got some very senior colleagues who have written completely crap proposals. And I, I sat on one, and it was it was it was notoriously bad. I mean, literally, he'd he'd cut and pasted, you know, for one molecule he was studying to another. Except occasionally he'd forgotten to cut and paste, so it it, it was awful. He still got 
one or two referees who gave it really quite good scores because they didn't referee the proposal, they were refereeing him. But the panel, we thought, this is absolutely we can't, this is ridiculous. We can't possibly accept this proposal. It's terrible. And uh, so we then had to write and explain you know, why this was not actually even going to be funded. It was a re straight reject. And I'm at a conference and he's sitting in front of me. And at coffee, he, I get, if I get this email message from the research council saying, we're just going to send this to Professor X, you know, do the text. Do you want to make any changes before we send it? I said, no, he's sitting in the conference in front of me, right? At the coffee, he comes up. He said, oh, I've just had my grant turned down. And uh, he said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I essentially said, yeah, I was on the panel. And I said, you know, just to be honest, you know, so, so, and he went, yeah, you said I did do it quickly. Yeah, I suppose you're right. So, so he knew, right? So, so, but most of the time you need a support network, anything else. You will have setbacks, you will have things, and you, and you need your mates around you. You need people who understand the process. I mean, you can go and vent to your friends and play squash or something, but you need, need an academic person to do it. Because you will fail. There's no doubt about it. We all do, okay? And you, you need to... I mean, so we've got the space side proposal in. I think it's actually the best one we've ever written, but there's a competing bid, which we shouldn't have a competing bid. The basis of the other competing bid, which refused to work with us, is because actually they're a little bit arrogant because they've got a Nobel Prize in their field in black holes and gravity waves, and therefore they don't want to talk to the rest of the community because we're better than you. I think that we've had told the com we've done what the community wants us to do. So if they just referee against the government, I think we've done it, and they don't. But we don't know. Go ahead. Um, so it would be a good idea to get example of successful proposals. Yeah. How would I get such examples? Yeah. If your institute, so if you're looking for a fellowship proposal, your institute's probably got one. If you're in a smaller country and maybe they haven't, then you can ask them and you can ask through your planet. So if you're applying for a Marie Curie proposal or an, or, or, and there's somebody in your field, we, we will probably be able to find somebody who's, well, we know people who have worked lots of Marie Curie proposals. We will find you one. And you have to get the one most recently because every time they do so horizon 2020 Marie Curie are not the same as horizon Europe so you want a more recent one and that's what the kind of mentoring series is so if you want copies we'll you, know, you may have them in your institute if you don't we can probably find you somebody because it will give you ideas yeah. every proposal is different but it's like you know ah it's like we've got oh, tomorrow we've got all these other networks coming together we're starting to finally work together when we wrote the proposal, we all found that the other person, we all had different, we were trying to do the same thing, but you know, everybody had slightly different, oh, that's a good idea, that's a good idea, we share the idea, so you'll see that. But if you're thinking of doing a Marie Curie for the September, you should be starting now, Yeah. which means you need to have copies pretty soon. So you tell me what field you're in and we'll see if we can find you something. What's your area? Um... Lunar science, Lunar science. I'm not applying this year, so I've got, got plenty of time. But right. um, in general, because I don't think my institute has copies. Where are you from? Germany, Brunswick. Okay. To Braunschweig. Okay. But there are plenty of people in Germany. In fact, Moon's really in at the moment because people are really thinking about forming a pan European uh, network for the Moon. Yeah. So the Moon's a really hot topic at the moment. But we'll find you some, don't worry. They'll, Mahash Enand, or people at the OU, or people in other, there are plenty of people around Europe who have worked on the moon. And, but you don't necessarily need a, a lunar one, you, you could have a planetary one or something. Yeah, just to get an idea how it works. In the we, 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 you, you contact me, we'll find you. Others, questions? Okay, there's a question online, Nigel. Yep. So I'll just read that out, um, and you might have to say it again because I'm part of the microphone. Are there any agencies or funds that are easier to write proposals for than others? Are there any agencies or something where it's easier to get uh, money from than others? Not really. Uh, everything is competitive now because there are so many people applying for awards. Um, that's being said, that there are sometimes there are calls which might be very specific that people for some reason don't apply to so you can be lucky and find that there's a this is one of the things we try to do in your planet the big proposals and the big funders are very competitive but some of the smaller ones which might have niche they might have some very in things that they just particularly want to fund people don't know about them so they don't apply for them i mean i had uh there was, in, in the UK, there was a call, my, uni, my old university, UCL, had links with Japan, and they had a special fund for people to go and work in Japan. 
but nobody knew about it. So one of my uh, students applied for it, got it, next year said, ah, I'd like to go back and do another six months there. And I said, well, you know, you've had six months, they probably won't give you another. He said, well, I want to give it a go. I said, yeah, give it a go. Nobody applied that year. So he got the other six months. Another one, the student I had, she was from Cyprus. She wanted to do a PhD. She went to Oxford for the interview. Uh, and we found this, this, this Cypriot fund, which was to support a PhD student from Cyprus at Oxford. Found it. Nobody applied for it. <laughs> so she got it. So you just got to look, at the, look, look, look for, for things. And, and sometimes the big calls, the Maui Curie and so on, will be competitive. But sometimes other, and national funding. But look for other alternatives. And, and, and sometimes you find things that, that just pop up. But it's always, usually it's always competitive. You, any other? I think we have another question okay. online. Um, uh, where is the best place to find funding opportunities? Ah, so that was where is the best place? Where is the best place to find funding opportunities? Um, there are uh, magazines. There's something called uh, Research Europe, Research Fortnight, uh, which uh, lists proposals from around. Your universities, or most big universities, will have an office, which a research office, which will announce uh, proposals. They will go to your, they will go to the academics, but there is absolutely no reason why they can't give it to you if you say you're looking for something. Um, we do try and publicize ones that are appropriate for Europlanet, and I think we've agreed this week we need to do more of that. We need to give more uh, opportunities, announce more opportunities on a website for people to look at, so to help. Um, if you're in your country, national funding agencies, they have all the, I mean, they're all online. I mean, you can, you can, you can add your email list for name to most funding agencies to get alerts and they will send them out to you. And you should have that little bit of a portfolio that you're looking for. Um, but that's part of your career plan. When you should all be having a kind of annual appraisal and annual interview. As part of that, it should be, where am I going to do next? And you, as part of that discussion, you should be discussing with your mentor or your line super, or your supervisor or your line manager, what type of funding can I apply for next? Um, and there are special funding for, for, for exchanges between particular countries. There's special funding for people from different uh, countries. There are several schemes which are only open to, to, to women. Or there are schemes that are open to people who have taken a career break, which can be men or women. Um, so there are plenty of other schemes around that you need to look at. And you need to identify that at the beginning of the year. You should be thinking now, what, what are the, and it's not, and it shouldn't just be, oh, I can only apply for the Maui Curie because that's all putting your egg in one basket. So if you don't get the Maui Curie, what's your plan B? Okay. Think of what plan B is. And, and, and that's also important. If, Maybe your plan B is, I, I could get a postdoc on a grant with Professor X in Zurich, okay? but I want to apply for the Maui Curie. And I had my, one of my students ask me this the other day. Do you think, but well, what happens if I get the fellowship? Will the person who's in Zurich be upset if I, if I say to them, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not taking your job, I'm going for that. And I said, well, they'd be pretty stupid if they do, because they, they must be knowing that what you've got is there. We would expect that. But her, her, her concern was that she couldn't do both at the same time because she might be letting down zero. No, you've got to have plan A, B, or C, right? We all expect it. So, you know, you might have two postdocs. You could apply for both. You might get none. You might get both. But then you might have your fellowship in the middle. You've got the portfolio, right? You, know, you, don't, you're not, you don't owe the other person anything. It's your career. And they will know that if you get a, a fellowship, it's going to trump over their, over their postdoc. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you have those different things. You, you've got to have... The main thing is you want to be paid and actually have some, you know, get a job at the end of this period. And you can't just do it by saying, oh, you know, I've only got this, this, this one. So the, the, if you're offered the postdoc position, great, because you've got some security in having that post. But then nothing's ventured, nothing gained in putting forward the proposal because you've actually got that as a surety. But if you get the fellowship, then your career goes in that direction. If you don't get the fellowship, you've got that job and you can apply for the fellowship again when you're there a year or two years later. But don't 
if you're, if you're applying for things that are personal, develop your career, you've, you've got to play, have several, several, several things. And try not to put all your proposals in one go, right? Because if you, it, because then you don't learn. If you fail, one of the things you do is read the criticism. So the referee's report might tell you what was the weakness in that proposal so that you can correct it in the next one. But if you put all your proposals in at the same time, then you rule yourself out for putting in proposals next year, but you haven't learned anything from the year you failed. I mean, this is why you have to stagger them sometimes. So you, if you are not having an annual appraisal, an annual review to talk about what you're going to do a year and two years down the line, then actually you've got bad practice in your institute. Okay? Your line manager should be having that discussion with you. And on top of that, have a mentor. That's what the Euro, Euro Planet mentoring scheme is about, because they're independent, etc. You've got that extra that extra advantage, and and your job will be to have with that mentor. I want to do this in one or two years' time. So how am I going to plan towards that over the next period? So I would be already saying to you, right, okay, you're going to put in this fellowship proposal. It says you need to show independence, right? Put in for a bursary for EPSC. Put in for a bursary for Beacon apply for a TA, go on a cost thing. So you're already building up that portfolio. What publications have you got? If you haven't got any publications, you're trouble. I mean, I have a very good colleague. I was reviewing her professorial system there. Brilliant in many other ways. Huge amount of money. She's only got 56 publications. For a professor at her stage, that's not enough. Okay? She's, she's done all the business and the politics and everything else, but she's forgotten her job is to be a scientist and produce papers. And if she has... X number of students, those students should be producing papers. If you've got a PhD student, that PhD student should be producing you three papers in their PhD. My recent student gave me 17. Hmm. I worked in very hard. <laughs> right? But that's the point. So if you are a professor, and I'm looking at your professor, and I say, well, you've had 20 PhD students, but you've only got 23 papers. You're not doing your job properly. Right? You're not doing the job for the PhD student. If, that, if a PhD student is leaving with only one publication, you haven't done your job properly as a supervisor. That means you've got to press the supervisor. If you've got the half-written paper, and you know you've got to apply for a fellowship, you need that paper. You've got to put the moral blackmail, well, actually not moral blackmail, you've actually got to tell them, right, I can't, you know, I, I, I'm worried, I'm putting in this fellowship proposal, but, you know, I've only got one publication because, you know, these other two publications I gave to you three months ago, you haven't read. I need you to read these so we can get them out so I can put them on my CV for the fellowship. You've got to be, you've got to be quite strong about that, really, just because you need those publications. Alternatively, the supervisor can come around and say, you know, yeah, get that paper written. Right? You know, you're not going on that conference. I want that paper written. You know, I you need that to get that. This grant, we, you know, if I'm going to get the next grant, I need to show that we've done stuff. You know, so because otherwise I'm going to write the public write the paper. That's not the point. You're writing the paper, so you're getting experience in writing the paper. Anything else? I have another quick one. Go on. So um, you talked about um, when we get people or friends, for example, to review our proposals maybe read not friends it. not friends sorry critical friends people who tell you it's crap we read it out loud to know yeah. what to emphasize um what stages do you usually go for so i've got a blank piece of paper do you do you draft it then redraft it yourself when you when you look over a first draft what do you try to think about do you try to come at it from a different angle what kind of how many goes do you have before you pass it on to someone how do you implement that feedback? What's your pipeline of proposal writing? It depends on the type of proposal that you're writing. Um, but I would say that, that if, if you're going to do it properly, you probably have at least three review drafts. You've got the first, so the first one is to tell you, uh, have, if, if, if it's your first time writing a proposal, the first draft is, is, is to see whether you're on the right lines. So the job of the person advising you is to really say, you know, have you got the right, is the title right? Is the abstract right? Is your idea any use whatsoever, right? So you have that kind of critical stuff. Then you produce the first draft of what you think is the case, you know, I've written the stuff. And that, that, that's where you want the person to come in and say, that understand. Yeah, I know your area of research, James, 
But from this, I wouldn't have a clue what you're talking about. You know, it's got to be that harsh critical analysis. Uh, you get the red, the red pen out, you know, etc. Um, then you give all that feedback, you go away and rewrite it again, and then you come back with what you think, with, 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 with your master text. And that will be better than the first one. It might then be finished, but probably not. It will probably be another round of tidying and everything else. And then you will correct that section and you will send it back. And then normally it's going to be, yeah, you didn't quite get what I wanted you to do in that paragraph, that paragraph. So three or four times, I would say. Okay. And this, this, um, this bit before you pass it over to someone of going through it, do you make a very rough copy? Do you make a speed run and a, and a, put your silver thread through it? I, I think, well, as I say, if you are very inexperienced and you really don't know how to write the proposal, you can put down your ideas. As you get more experience, yeah, the first version is, 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 is a rough draft. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's proper text, you know, uh, so that we've already got something to start with. But it might be if the first time you're doing it, you just want to get down the ideas and you're just trying to, it might be that you're, you've come up with a title, you've come up with an idea, you write the idea, you write the methodology because you're probably better at that. You've got a, you're, you're more on top of it. So you kind of know that you, you want to develop it from the code that you've done and you write that bit. But the key thing is what are the final object, what are the objectives and what are the results going to be? Because that's, that's the first thing, the title, the idea, what the objective is and what you're going to produce. Simultaneously, what resources do you need? Because if you haven't done resources before and you've got to get the university to cost cost things, let's say that the, the, the financial limit is 100,000. Have you any idea that you put down, I want a postdoc, I want to buy the software license, I want to buy these consumables. And if you, you, you won't know whether that comes to 150,000. <laughs> what? So, so if you haven't done this before, you have to do that first stage as well, parallel. Okay. okay. But the first draft should be a draft. So as I say, what's the title? What are you trying to do? What's the methodology? What are the, um, what are the outcomes? Then you start to fill in the other bits, the, the background and everything else. But that's the first bit I would always pass on to somebody. And then the second full draft would be complete. It would have the, uh, the background. It would have those references. So that I could point out and said, um, yeah, you haven't mentioned the, you know, talking about exoplanets, but you haven't mentioned either of the ESA missions and you're applying to an ESA grant, mm, probably not a good idea. But point out things like that. Mm -hmm. Then you get what you think is your perfect draft, right? And then you send it. I mean, we write ours. We, we, we write our Euro planet proposal, right? All the scientists write the planet proposals. Then it goes to Anita, right? She's the the crafts person, right? She's the journalist. She can actually write English, right? Unlike the rest of us, right? And she'll look at it and she'll say, this is, you know, it's, it's brilliant if you understand, uh, if you're an IT specialist and a geek, right? Nobody else is going to understand a word that you've written, right? Uh, yeah, so she will then tell you how you need to rewrite it and restructure it, which is why we get better and better proposals at that stage. So, so, so I would say that generally, probably at your stage, probably four drafts. Okay. And that's why you have to start now to get to September. Four drafts is a lot. It's a big commitment from the person on the other side as well. I was going to, I was going to mention that actually leaning on people to, to help you for this is obviously quite a big ask because I imagine it's quite time consuming to get yeah. proper constructive feedback. Are there uh, like people in on a similar level in their career people hire is there a good way to approach it's normally somebody, somebody like who's done it you yeah. want to mentor somebody who's been through it uh -huh. there's nothing to stop you sharing proposals yourselves i mean you're going to practice we probably haven't got time now because we've talked over it but if you're going to do okay. presentations okay um it's great to pass it around between yourselves i mean we actually even had this at the university recently because none of our students had, had done uh, had actually sat in person exams this year right mm -hmm. So we gave them the option of having an in-person exam, but we said, we're not going to mark it. You, you, you mark it yourselves as a group, okay? And we got them all in the room to, to mark each other's and talk about each other's and so on. Um, it didn't work terribly well because at least the final year students were very arrogant and thought they didn't need to do this practice. And then they went into final exams and they were crap. And I could tell that they'd run out of time because most of the second half of the questions weren't complete. And I knew that they knew the stuff because they just simply ran out of time. So you can use your peer groups. 
you know, you must have done this as an undergraduate. You must have shared, you know, oh, maybe will you read my, my thesis? Well, I'll practice my final year talk with you. It's exactly the same. But you need that extra experience from above. And most people will do it. I mean, you know, the, 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 the art of academic academia is that you, you, you have to give, you know, you do feel, most people feel they do have to give back. I mean, you know, we're not, there are a few very selfish people, but not, not in general. The and the planetary science community is not like that. The planetary science community works because we all have to collaborate. None of us are going to run a space mission on our own, you know. We all have to collaborate. So people know this. And this is the whole point, of, again, of Europlanet, the whole point of the, you know, people volunteer. We haven't got a problem finding people to be mentors. You know, there are plenty of people who are prepared to mentor, okay? I, I, I personally, you know, you, you kind of get to a stage where I get a lot of personal satisfaction from seeing that people that were my students and so on now be successful and get, get professorships. Because I kind of think, well, I made a difference. Yeah, yeah, I made a difference. You know, that person's career is developed because I kind of put some input in. That's a that's a nice feeling. So you won't have a problem finding people. But if you tell them, oh, can you on when, on Friday evening, can you give it back to me on Monday morning? The answer will be probably no. Yeah, understood. Any other questions? So get your mentor now. Think who you want as a mentor now if you haven't got one, right? And remember that mentor will, is, is, is your critical friend, right? So you have a great relationship with them and so on. But remember, their job is really to be critical. And ultimately, the worst thing is if you, five, six years' time, you've, done your, you've tried for fellowships, you've tried for lectureships, and you haven't got them, the mentor is going to have to tell you, I don't think you're going to make it in academia. And somebody's going to have to tell you that, because it's not fair on you otherwise. Just plowing on, on short time, money, you know, the head of the department or somebody's going to have to turn around to you and say, I'm sorry, James, you know, actually, you know, it hasn't worked, right? You know, it probably now, you know, the next, there's no new generation coming up. You're a bit long in the tooth now, right? You know, you're probably not going to get the position. I don't think, you know, you know you, you, you're good. No doubt that you've done good work. You've produced some really good publications and everything else. But you're probably not going to get over that final hurdle. And somebody's going to have to tell you that. A critical friend is going to have to tell you that. And, you may, and you've got to be able to listen to that. That's what your critical friend's for. You can have your other friends to go and cry with and talk of and say the world's unfair and everything else. Your critical friend's job is to be critical. I need people to tell me that. Then the question we talked about fellowships yeah. and like other grants. Yeah. And you said with fellowships, it might be more right, like your personal experience and what you do might count a little bit more yeah. than within the other. It's all about that. Fellowships, you. Yeah. So you would say it's, but you also put the science case, right? Yeah. You have to, you have to explain a, a fellowship is. I want to do this science. I want to lead this science. I want to be. I want to be the person who's who's able now to deliver this project. Me, it's personal. It's not to the group. It's not to the professor. It's not to the institute. It's to you. Yeah. And and that step you're going to have to do if you want to be in academia, you're going to have to get through that case because that fellowship will then be what will lead to maybe a permanent position or something else. But most people now go through a fellowship program, and even if you apply for a lectureship. If you've had a fellowship, the institution will think, oh, the community has judged this person to get that fellowship, so therefore they must be quite good. So therefore they'll be quite good for us. But a fellowship has got to be personal. So you've got to stop thinking about writing things. We, the group, it's me, I. So I have really written that. And then you've got to justify that. And then when you go for interview, You've got to do it in front of the interview. And the interview is the other bit. I haven't got time to talk about it now, but the, the interview technique is really important. Because there, you, 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 you look at the proposals, and then you get people in the interview, and you think, this, this, this proposal's excellent. And then you get the person in front of you, and they can't defend it. They, 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 they don't give a good interview. And this one here, which you thought, oh, it's OK. And then they come in, and they, they storm it. They, 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 you just get the feeling this person knows exactly what they want to do. They've got the motivation. Yeah, yeah. So when you go to interview, the the, the 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 ground is clear you know when you go to interview there are 10 people in the room they're going to fund for doesn't really what the marks are before it's how you perform on the day so you've got to practice during the interview right you've got to think about the nasty questions that are going to be asked the ones that are going to throw you and said you've got to have rehearsals etc most places will rehearse you okay and practice it give talks give talks but most of all you've got to a fellowship is about you 
and, and, and fellowships are about, usually they're particularly career ones, they're all about your potential. We, we don't expect you to have yet to become Einstein. What we're looking for is to say that potential that you can have to be in the field. And as I say, most people, my colleague said, I'm always looking for the person who I want to work with. If I'm a geochemist and I'm a, and this person's applying for a fellowship in geochemistry, I'm thinking, am I going to work with this person for the next 10 years? Is this, the, is this person somebody I would want to invite to my lab? I'd like to write grant proposals with. And the other thing is get, get yourself known, because if you get an interview, if they know you and they know your work, it's an advantage. So when you're at conferences, make sure that the senior people in the field, go up to them and talk to them, right? you know, don't be a shrinking violet, don't hide back, you know. Again, the Americans never have this problem, they'll talk to you anyway, but Europeans are often a bit shy, you know, oh, that's a senior professor over there, well, I won't go and talk to them, you know. Do! We're not, we're not, you know, most of us are quite happy to talk to, to any, any younger people, you know, etc. So make sure you get known in the community, go and give talks. You know, if you get an opportunity to go and give a seminar or something, do it, you know. The person who has a job in an institution for organizing the weekly seminars, it's a terrible job, right? If somebody sends you an email and says, I'd like to come see your institute, and by the way, you know, would I be able to give a seminar? Yes, great, one more or less. I filled the slot on November the 22nd. <laughs> Invite yourself, and then it goes on your CV. If you're thinking of going somewhere for doing a Maui Curie, for God's sake, go and visit it. Make sure you've talked to the people there. Make sure you like the people there. <laughs> because that's another important thing, which group you join. They might be a brilliant scientific group, but maybe the, the atmosphere or the, it, it isn't quite right for you, right? You know, we all get to choose. You know, most, you, know, you can move around. You know, there are just some places, it might be brilliant, it might be, oh, great expert in the field there. One, you know, all the experts are there. But maybe you just don't fit. You know, maybe you just don't feel it's the right atmosphere. You know, don't go there because you think I've just got to go there because it's 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 the big institute. And sometimes I'll be perfectly honest. Uh, there's this expression in English being a big fish in a small pond. Sometimes for establishing your career, it's better to go somewhere which is good, but you can make more impact because maybe there's only six of you in the group and you'll be one of six academics or whatever, rather than being one of sixty. You can join the one in sixty later in your career. I, I moved from UCL to Open University when I was given my professorship at, at quite young, like 40. And people said, well, you know, you're leaving UCL. When UCL top university, why are you going there? Well, A, I've been there a long time, so I had everybody remembering me as an undergraduate and telling me every year that I, I, I lost out the right answer. The, the second thing was there were too many big professors there. So how was I going to impose myself? When I went to the Open University, I went there as the boss. Right? And I could, I could then take the lead. So, for example, don't ignore Eastern Europe. If you're applying for a Marie Curie fellowship, you get a second bite of the cherry. If you, if you, if you don't get 92% plus in the Marie Curie fellowship, but you are applying to a country in Central Eastern Europe or Portugal, there is a backup scheme funded for people who go to those countries. And there are many, many, many good groups in those countries. And if you are the Marie Curie person in that country, or you're the ERC person in that country, you're the star. You are the star then. You go to Oxford, right? They have kind of, you never get a job in Oxford because they've got so many of these people from all over the world, right? They've got fellows coming out their ears, right? So they, they, they can't possibly support them all. But you go to a smaller university, then you're, you are, you're the, oh, wow, we've got, we've got a Marie Curie fellow. We've got an ERC. Wow, this is really big. You might end up talking to the prime minister. I did. <laughs> but if you go to Oxford, you won't because there'll be lots of you. So, so, so think on that, but also make sure that you're working in a place you like to work. Ne never forget that. The, you know, groups have different dynamics and characteristics and everything else, and some might be more, you know, think about where you'd be happy. You remember, you, okay, you, you do have to work 24 seven, but when you're, you, but you know, you've got to be somewhere you like as well. So, so yeah. and as I say, don't forget places, as I say, you know, Eastern Europe and other places, smaller universities, they can be much more friendly there. There's more of a kind of team spirit, you know, more of a dynamic because there are a few of you and you can all get together. You, know, you can all go out, you know, if, if the group's, say, a dozen or 15 people, you can go out as a group meeting with a beer every Friday. You can't do that in Oxford or Cambridge. You know, Cambridge astronomy groups, what, 400 people? You so you go out as a subgroup. You probably never know those people over there. Oh, that, that, that floors the cosmologists. I never talk to cosmologists. So. 
but if you're in a smaller group, you get more ideas. So, so think about that as well. But finally, if you're passionate about it, I'll just say, go for it. You know, my hobby, I think, is history. And, you know, it's all about when do people you know, find to change the world. You, young people are there to change the world, right? Before we all become conservative and worry about taxes and pensions and teenagers. If you are not enthusiastic about what you are doing now, when will you be? Right? So you are going, I mean, your retirement age for your generation is what's probably going to be pushing 70, right? So if you stay in the area of space science, you have got many, many years ahead of you. Right? Why not invest the next few years in enjoying the science you do and moving around and doing it? Because this is your opportunity, okay? You know, before you get tied down with other things in life, and mortgages and families, which everything becomes a bit more complicated. But scientifically too, this is the time for you to have those ideas. So, so, so have a bit of that youth confidence which sadly we seem to be losing. It seems all the criteria now are saying that Generation Z is much more nervous and more negative and pessimistic. Go back a few centuries. The people who went abroad and discovered and did all the stuff were the young people. They were the young people. They went out there and they, 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 they had the ambition. And I think the science, we, this is where you should be having your ambition. And go for it. If it doesn't work and you have your mentor who says, well, you know, you've tried for all these fellowships, it didn't quite work. Maybe the, you know, you're not going to get one, so now have your plan B. But don't, don't be at 45 thinking, you know, I really wish I'd tried for that. Yeah, big grumpy person in the middle of the room. It's your, it's your age. It's your era. Go for it. Be confident. Not overconfident, but be confident. You've got the time. Try it. You'll have plenty of support from people in the field to do it. And some of you will be... You know, Will be, will be very successful, and in 30 years' time, you'll be sitting in a room like this telling the next generation about what I've told you today, hopefully. All right? Yeah. Um, see, about the, the other part about management and resources, how helpful is it to have those experience outside of academia? Is it really to just... Yeah, I mean, that's another thing, that if you, if you run a sports club, or if you run a charity, or if you do something for the university, you're a union rep, or... Or anything, that's all experience. I mean, oh, you'll get asked questions like, you're, you, we're giving you this money to set up a research group. You have a PhD student who's not doing well. What experience have you got in dealing with a difficult person or telling somebody, or, or dismissing somebody, telling somebody they're not doing the job properly? How are you going to handle that? And that would be a question you might get in the interview. In fact, it's a very common question in the interview. How are you going to manage your team? How are you going to get rid of the person who doesn't do the job properly? You know, or what if you get somebody who, who how do you face up to maybe, I don't know, you get, a, you get a postdoc who actually doesn't respect you. They think they're better than you, right? Well, you know, this is woman running this group, you know, I'm better than her, you know. How are you going to deal with that person? I'm the boss, not you. I'm, this is my project. You do what I tell you. So you can be nice and you can be supportive, but how are you going to deal with those type of issues? Okay. Because you might get asked those in an interview, because it's perfectly reasonable, because the project will fail if you can't address those issues. How are you going to recruit these people? How, what's your recruitment policy? How are you going to get these people? Okay. That, they are questions that you will get in ERC interviews, for example, uh, very common, because they're giving you one and a half million or whatever to do this. That's a lot of money. They want to know how you're going to manage that project, how you're going to manage the resources. And again, you'll say, well, you know, I haven't got experience in that, but I've got a couple of mentors who will mentor me in that. You know, I've got people I can go to if I get a problem. I've got, I've got somebody I can go to and they'll, you know, they'll act as my advisor. So I've got somebody and I'll be able to address that or, or whatever. Or, but as I say, outside life experiences are great. I mean, you know, I don't know if you're in the uh, Dutch flying corps, Right, you know, and you've been a, a TA officer, you, great, you've got experience, right? Or you've got some other job, you've taken a job outside. And it can be quite small things. It can be, I remember somebody saying, when asked them this question, said, well, without my entire degree in PhD, I, uh, I was also part-time, I ran, um, it wasn't Starbucks, but it was the equivalent. I was the, I was the local branch manager. I, I had managerial responsibility. 
and I hired and fired students from the university who were working in my cafe. And that was their example of an experience that they'd had. They'd been given responsibility by Starbucks, which is not insignificant, and they'd actually got experience of saying, yeah, I had to hire and fire people because they, you know, I was hiring the students who were running the cafe with me. Okay, they've got some experience. So yeah, use things outside your academic life as well. Have you been a team leader? Have you been captain of a, I don't know, football or lacrosse or hockey team? That's experience. You had to select people for the team. You had to tell people they weren't playing in the team. Right? That's experience of being a manager, a leader. If there's nothing else, we're at... Um... <laughs> no, I'm sorry, you haven't done any of your interviews. Well, that's fine. We have uh, the, the next session in this room, which is for EPEC as well, is the... Um making your posters a little bit more uh, interactive. So uh, we will have an opportunity to do these skills here. Um, this was definitely a good use okay. of your expertise. No problem. Feel, and, if exp and for posters, can I also remind you one other thing? How many of you have brought CVs with you this week? None? When do, what, this is the perfect time for handing over a CV to an academic. Any conference, EPSC. If you give me, or you've either got it on computer, or even better, a hard copy, I can read it on the train, on the plane going home, because I've got nothing else to do, usually. So why, if you're looking for a postdoc job, this is what conferences are for. If you're looking for a next position, you've got something EPSC or one of the big conferences, make sure you take your CVs with you. And hard copies do work, by the way, even in this traditional age. Because if you say, I'll send it to you next week after the conference, worst possible time, Academic's been away for a week, comes back, 400 emails, which they haven't answered in a week. Your CV one is hidden in there. Forget it. Forget it. On the other hand, you've given it to me, and I've got a six-hour flight back from San Antonio, and in my bag, oh, yes, I've got that CV. Oh, I might have a look at it. And I'm thinking, oh, hmm, that's interesting. Oh, and I wonder, I wonder what I could do with this person. Business cards as well. Anything does it. And not just emails, because, as I say, email boxes after conferences, not good. Right. Okay, yeah. If you, I'm around the rest of the week, obviously. If you're coming to the social dinner, you can talk to me tonight. If you're not at the social dinner, talk to me. Anything else, happy to talk, as are many other people in the Euro Planet. And if you haven't got a Euro Planet mentor, yeah, let me know get a Euro Planet mentor. Sorted. That's what we're here for. That's right. And I wish you luck. Obviously, if you become rich and famous and get the Nobel Prize, um, I want recognition and half a percent of the prize. Yeah. It's in the small print at the bottom of the slides, right? <laughs> which I'll send out after this week, yeah. which will also be useful. So thanks very much. My Dave. pleasure. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. And stand for some of the positions in EPS, APEC as well, yes. because that got good on the CV. So James needs new people. Volunteer. Yes, the whole week is a big recruitment. Absolutely. I'm recruiting.